Over the course of human history, we have continued to see advancements in agricultural production, which has transformed how people around the world produce food. Today on the Mr. Sin Channel, we're going to explore some of those changes as we review different challenges to contemporary agriculture and talk about the different concerns that people have with the current state of agriculture. Ever since the Green Revolution, the use of genetically modified organisms, antibiotics, and chemical fertilizers, pesticides, pesticides, and herbicides have been on the rise. This has allowed for crops and livestock to grow faster and have higher yields, resulting in more profit for farmers and a larger food supply for countries around the world. All of which is a good thing. However, people have also started to raise concerns over some of these practices, wondering what the impact these practices have on the food that they are producing, and if there will be any unintended consequences that may come from these different practices. Today, people are starting to ask questions such as is, are we producing food in a manner that is both ethical and sustainable? What are the possible unintended side effects of using antibiotics, growth hormones, and genetically modified organisms to increase our agricultural output? People are also starting to take notice on how many of our agricultural systems have become industrialized, particularly in more economically developed areas. This has led to the rise of feedlots, CAFOs, and large multinational agro-businesses. These new agro-businesses are able able to achieve economies of scale, which allows them to produce more goods at a lower individual cost. This new industrialized system leads to more agricultural products being produced, but also leads to more mechanized systems and makes it difficult for small family farms to compete in the market, since they often have higher individual costs with the production of their goods. These new systems also require livestock animals to be a certain size and weight so that they can be able to be processed in the plant. Now, Livestock are often injected with growth hormones, antibiotics, and given feeds such as corn that is not always part of their natural diet to help decrease the time it takes to raise the animal and increase the size of the animal. All of which allows for more food production, but also leads to questions about food safety and possible unintended consequences of these practices. And these changes aren't just impacting our cows, chickens, and pigs, they're also impacting our fish. We can examine what's been happening with aquaculture, which is the rearing of aquatic animals. Oftentimes markets focus on just a few species of fish for consumption and production, and they look for new ways to mass produce the fish in the most cost-effective manner. All of these different technologies, tools, and practices increase the startup costs for farmers and can lead to questions about how our food is being produced and if it's being done in an ethical manner. Today we can see the location of where our food is produced and processed often depends not only on the local environment or the cost of production, but also on the different government policies that are in place. Farms today are more likely to operate in areas that offer more agricultural subsidies, which are payments that the government gives a farmer to produce certain products. This results in farms producing more of a specific product and located in areas with more pro-farm policies, while regions that have stricter regulations, less government aid, and more expensive operating costs often see less businesses and farms locate there. This not only impacts the food production of a country or region, but can have a larger impact as well. For example, corn is one of the most subsidized crops in the United States of America, which helps reduce the cost of production for corn and increases the overall production of the crop. This has not only changed how corn is used in the United States, but in 1994 when NAFTA was established, it also impacted Mexico and other countries as well. You can see the impact of NAFTA and these subsidies when looking at this bar graph showing the imports of different agricultural products from the United States States of America to Mexico. Notice that after 1992, the amount of imports of different agricultural products significantly increased. Part of the reason is NAFTA being passed in 1994, which made it easier and cheaper to trade between countries. In fact, when comparing the years 1990 to 1992 and 2006 to 2008, we can see that the amount of exports from the United States to Mexico increased by 413% for corn, 599% for wheat, 531 1% for rice, and 707% for pork. Mexico imported these agricultural products at a higher rate, partially because NAFTA reduced the trade barriers between the countries, and because these products were cheaper in the United States due to the different government policies which reduced the overall cost of production for these products, resulting in cheaper prices. This unfortunately had the unintended consequence of putting many Mexican farmers out of work, and also led to increased emigration from Mexico and 
increased immigration to the United States. So in this case, we can see government policies not only impacted how much food is being produced, but where it's produced, where it's exported to, and even migration patterns of people. Changing gears from food policies, let's explore the impact that agriculture has had on freshwater sources. Farms around the world use irrigation methods in different ways to quickly and efficiently get their water to their crop, which allows farmers to reduce the farmer's dependency on factors they cannot control, like when it's going to rain. However, increased irrigation can also lead to more water runoff, which can increase the amount of water pollutants in a local aquifer and fresh bodies of water. This is due to chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, or manure finding its way into local water sources. There's also a risk irrigation policies drain local aquifers and deplete the fresh water in an area. Today, we can see problems with water shortages impacting the western region of the United States and many other countries as well, such as in Arizona, where farmers are experiencing water cuts due to a decline in reservoir levels across the western United States. Farms that have irrigated crops for generations are now facing drought conditions, empty irrigation canals, and water shortages, which reduces their ability to produce their crops. This is just one example of how farmers are trying to figure out how best to use their soil, water, and other resources to produce their product, and how changes in our environment, policies, and society are impacting those decisions. Another concern that people have is how our agricultural practices are impacting the amount of biodiversity in our environment. If we as a society reduce the amount of biodiversity in an ecosystem, we may be putting unique habitats at risk and inadvertently impacting other animals and organisms in the area. Plus, we also put our food supply at risk from changes in the climate or invasive species that could destroy our local crops and our food supply. This reduction in the biodiversity in an ecosystem is only made worse by the practice of monocropping, which helps increase the profits and efficiency of a farm, but reduces the variety of plant species being planted. Now, it isn't just the production of our food that has consequences. We can see that even when our food is harvested and ready to ship, there are inefficiencies in the system that lead to food spoiling and becoming wasted. Problems in food distribution often stem from a lack of quality infrastructure that's needed to quickly and safely get food to the market. Food distribution issues have created inequalities and unequal access to fresh food around the world, with many less economically developed countries lacking fresh food and a constant and dependable food supply. This problem becomes worse when you factor in global conflicts or natural disasters, which put more constraints on global production and distribution. I also want to highlight that it's not just developing countries in the world that struggle with getting fresh food and maintaining a constant food supply. Developed countries do so as well. For example, throughout the United States, we can see the impact of food deserts, which are areas that do not have access to healthy food and often lack access to a traditional grocery store or supermarket. People who live in food deserts are more likely to get their food from a convenience store or fast food restaurant and are more likely to have problems with obesity and diabetes. Unfortunately, some of these problems are not going to be going away anytime soon. As more people continue to move to urban areas, we will continue to see urban sprawl occur, which ends up replacing arable land with suburbs, cities, and other settlements, thus reducing the amount of land that can be used to produce food. Now, it isn't all gloom and doom. Today, we can see the rise of community-supported agriculture, urban farming, organic farming, fair trade practices, and value-added crops. Community-supported agriculture, or CSA for short, is when a farmer sells some of their crops and products to local consumers who have agreed to buy those products throughout the year. This not only helps support the local farmer by reducing the risk of not selling their products, but also helps reduce the amount of food miles of the crops, which helps reduce pollution, which makes our agricultural production even more sustainable. In case you didn't know, food miles is the distance that food is transported from the time it is made to the time it takes to get to the consumer. The more miles between where the food is produced and the consumer, the more pollution we have. Today, we can see that the food miles problem is likely responsible for about 6% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Urban farming often takes the shape of small-scale farms that exist in an individual's backyard, on their rooftop, balcony, or a community garden. Urban farming can help produce fresh food for densely populated areas, help counter food deserts, create great green spaces, and also offer recreational activities for individuals in the community. Organic farming produces food that focuses on using natural methods to grow crops
crops and raise animals without different chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, or GMOs. Organic farms seek to produce food in an environmentally friendly manner that leads to less soil, water, and air pollution. We can also see the rise of fair trade practices and products, which allow consumers to directly purchase from the people who created the product or the farmer who produced the food. The people who produce the food or the good will often get more of the profit instead of the profit going more to a larger company. Individuals who produce fair trade products not only get more of the profit, but are also often treated better and have better working conditions compared to individuals who work for large multinational corporations. Lastly, we have value-added crops, which are agricultural products that have been processed in a way that increases their overall value. Products such as different jams, cereals, or juices are all examples of value-added crops. These products consist of different crops and agricultural products, which come together to make a product that is more valuable than the individual ingredients. Oftentimes, the production process for value-added crops includes packaging, branding, preservatives being added, and other ingredients and materials coming together to create a new product. So we can see that different government policies, production costs, dietary preferences, trends, and technological changes will continue to shift our food production in new and different ways. How we produce our food, what food we produce, and where we produce it will continue to change as the years go on. And just like that, another topic review video is done. Now you know the drill geographers, answer the questions on the screen, and when you're done, check your answers down in the comment section below or the description of this video. Remember, if you found value in this video and you wanna see more, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And check out my ultimate review packet for more help with your AP Human Geography class. The packet is an amazing resource that'll help you get an A in your class and a five on the national exam. As always, I'm Mr. Sin, and I'll see you next time online.